There was a saying within the Royal Air Force between the wars that the bomber would always get through. A philosophy that would receive a rude awakening during the Second World War, but until then, this was a generally held belief. And so, during the 1920s and 30s, the Air Ministry experimented with all sorts of aircraft designs in the search for the perfect bomber hunter. Many of these designs involved novel armament layouts, often including fairly heavy guns for fighter aircraft. Some of these designs were more interesting than others, but they all had one universal drawback. None of the Ministry specifications written for these bomber hunters foresaw the need for defending against escort fighters, and so performance and manoeuvrability were not seen as an important factor for the requirement. As a result of this, many of these experimental aircraft were designed purely as flying weapon platforms, and the idea of them having to defend themselves against fighter aircraft was not even considered. All of this meant that many of these so-called bomber hunters were slow, cumbersome, and fairly useless. But one of the few examples that could have broken this trend was the Bolton Paul P-31 Bittern. The Bittern was built to meet Air Ministry Specification 27-24. This outlined the requirement for an interceptor and night fighter that was capable of breaking up formations of heavy bombers. During a time when the single-engine biplane ruled supreme, Bolton Paul designer John North took the adventurous step of drawing up a design that would not be considered commonplace for another decade to come. His aircraft, the P-31, was a single-seat, twin-engine, shoulder-mounted monoplane, a rapid departure from most designs of the time. But that being said, North also did his best to keep the design of the structure as simple as possible, to keep costs down and make it easy to maintain. The fuselage was a basic box girder structure, without rounded decking or fairings, and covered in fabric. The wings were parallel cord throughout, the control surfaces were basic square cut shapes, and all of these too were covered in fabric. Mid mounted on these wings were a pair of 230 horsepower, 7 cylinder Armstrong Sidley Lynx radials, and their nacelles formed one of the connecting points for the Bittern's wide track undercarriage. Its design was relatively simple, a simple oleo pneumatic strut, which was supported by V struts, and its wide track was chosen to improve the aircraft's ability to land safely at night. The pilot's cockpit was located in line with the wing leading edge, which provided excellent visibility. Not only was this ideal for takeoff and landing, which at night would be aided by the illumination of flares, but it also gave the pilot an excellent field of view in which to employ the P-31's unique weapon system. It was designed to have a pair of streamlined barbettes installed on the sides of the fuselage below the cockpit, and in these would be a single 303 caliber Lewis gun. These barbettes would be controlled by the pilot, allowing him to adjust the firing angle from straight ahead up to an elevation of 45 degrees. Aiming the weapons was done through a ring and bead sight that elevated along a special frame to match the elevation of the guns. This would allow the Bittern to both attack bombers directly in its line of sight, or more favourably, it would allow an attack from below, where the bombers were considered most vulnerable. Two prototypes of the Bittern were produced. The first was completed without the rotating barbettes, the machine guns being installed in a fixed firing position and it's unknown whether this was done due to issues developing them, or if they wanted a more simple prototype to begin with for airframe testing. Whatever the reason, the first prototype took off for the first time in February of 1927, and during its first flight, things immediately started to go wrong. Test pilot C.A. Rhea noted an alarming lack of lateral control, but at first they couldn't figure out why. The ailerons appeared to have an adequate amount of movement, and ground testing confirmed no loss of motion between the control input and the control services. Rhea felt he could solve the problem if he were able to observe the control services in flight, but the ailerons on the outer wing were shielded from view by the engines. Even with his seat raised to the highest possible position, it was impossible to see what was going on. 
but in typical English fashion, a solution was found in the form of the thickest, stoutest cushion they could find, which allowed Rhea to thrust his head uncomfortably high above the protection of his windscreen to see. During his next test flight, his face being battered by the wind the entire time, Rhea noted with alarm that the outer wings were flexing to such an extent during flight that it was cancelling out the effect of the ailerons. After easing the semi-controllable plane back to terra firma, further ground tests were done to simulate the effects of aerodynamic forces during flight, and it was found that the flexing of the wings occurred throughout the majority of the speed range. Along with the control problems, making it almost unflyable at anything above takeoff speed, there were also concerns raised about the airspeeds in general. During the initial flights, wobbly wings notwithstanding, it barely managed a top speed of 145 miles an hour. This meant that the bittern could only catch up to the heaviest, slowest bombers currently fielded. Anything in the light or medium range would be able to match or even outpace it, and with the way things were advancing, heavy bombers wouldn't be far behind either. As a result of this, numerous changes were made to the second prototype, which was then still under construction. Additional V-struts were added to the outer wings to solve the flexing issue. Along with this, the overall wingspan was increased by 5.5 feet, and Hanley Page leading edge slats were installed to improve its handling. The engines were remounted so that they sat in nacelles that were slung under the wing rather than within it, and this allowed the undercarriage struts to be shortened and strengthened. The engines also had new town end rings installed in the hopes of getting some more speed out of the airframe. Though it would have seemed an obvious area for improvement, the engines were not changed out for more powerful models, despite examples with at least double the power output being available. Some have argued that John North made this decision because adding more powerful engines would have required a stronger airframe, and thus a heavier airframe. However, had the correct engine been chosen, and for this a Bristol Jupiter would have been ideal, the increased power would have negated the drawback of increased weight, and at the same time there would have been enough power left over to increase the top speed. But this of course was never done. And so, when the second prototype took flight, its top speed was only increased by about 7 miles an hour. That being said, it was at least stable in flight, and between 1927 and 1930, it completed various trials at Martlesham Heath. As it was only slightly larger than contemporary biplane fighters of the time, its handling was quite good. Indeed, for a monoplane, it impressed many people in this regard, and we must remember that during this time there was still a strong bias against monoplanes in Britain, misguided though they were. Also, unlike the first prototype, this second model did have the rotating barbettes installed for the machine guns, and these too impressed evaluators. But speed was the big elephant in the room, and it was generally accepted that the Bolton Paul Bittern was too slow. A point highlighted by the fact that the Bolton Paul Sidestrand bombers could match its top speed and the newly designed Bristol Bulldog fighters could easily outpace it when it came to bomber hunting. As a result, the aircraft was not ordered into production, and the two prototypes would remain as the only examples built. Both aircraft continued to fly into the early 1930s, being used for various tests, particularly around their wings, but at some point, around the middle of the decade, they were most likely scrapped. Had the Bittern been built with more powerful engines from the outset, and thus been faster, it could have revolutionised the design of British night fighters and interceptors. But as it was, they were a failure, and by the mid-1930s, the RAF had moved away from the idea of a dedicated night fighter, instead calling for service aircraft that were equally capable for both day and night operations. This would lead to numerous designs, chief among them being the Hawker Hurricane, but that's a much longer story for another day. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the patrons, with a special shout out to Kevin, Deliado, Bain, FB, Christopher R, Tronathon, Eric Hindman, and John Austin Jr. for their support as Wing Commander tier patrons. Thank you all so much, and I'll catch you all next time.